Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, our third CGFI annual forum. Uh, fantastic to see uh, so many people here. Um, so my name is Matt Scott, and uh, I'm the executive director of CGFI. Um, just before I get going, I'd love to understand for how many people is it your first CGFI forum? Put, put up your hand. Oh, wow. OK, quite, quite a few newbies. Um, and how many people have done the, the hat trick of forums and you've been with us all three okay maybe about 10 hands or so in the room <laughs> well whether you're uh, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've joined for all of the forums that we have it's really really great uh, that you're here um, and um, great to see so many familiar faces too uh, I'm um, for people that know me the, the greening of finance and investment is something that's been close to my heart for some time um, since first briefing Mark Carney at the Bank of England about 10 years ago, helping to lead the Bank of England's Climate Hub and then the UK's first green finance strategy, and then more recently helping to chair the disclosure framework uh, of the Transition Plan Task Force. Um, so, um, I think, firstly, I think we can all feel really excited, actually, by how much has happened in the last 10 years. Uh, I think when climate was a side of desk activity, activity for me at the, at the Bank of England, it was hard to imagine that 10 years later, we would have 150 central banks and supervisors working together to green the financial system, that we would have nearly $150 trillion of assets around the world committed to net zero finance, and that we'd also be talking not only about managing transition risk, but also thinking about transition plans and transition planning. Um, so firstly, I think it's, it's good to, to acknowledge where we have got to. Um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes, probably about 15 minutes or so at the start, just to sort of set out some perspectives of how I think the greening of finance has evolved over the last decade. Uh, and then talk a little bit around uh, the, the, uh, the work that we do at the Centre for Greening Finance and Investments, and then talk a little bit more about the plan for today and how all that fits together. And then I'll hand over and invite up uh, Vanessa Harvard-Williams as our first keynote speaker to talk to, uh, talk to us about the Transition Finance Market Review. Um, but before doing that, I just wanted to, to do uh, a few quick acknowledgements. Firstly, to the core team, and in particular to Alex. I don't know if Alex is in the room somewhere. He wants to put up his hand. He's done an incredible amount of hard work pulling this together. Uh, and then also to acknowledge all of you, because I think one of the reasons why CGFI exists is to bring together a brilliant community that we have here today that brings some of the world's leading academics together with financial practitioners, with data and analytic providers, and with policymakers and regulators. So I think. In many ways, the magic often happens when we bring different disciplines together. So do you make the most of everybody that you meet today? Um, and then also just wanted to, to pass on Ben Caldercott's apologies. Uh, some of you may know Ben is the academic director of, of CGFI and has played a founding role. He would love to have been here, but unfortunately he's, uh, he's uh, scheduled change and he's out of the country. But he sends his, his warmest wishes. So having said all of that, um, getting into just a bit of scene setting for the day, talking through how the greening of finance has evolved, how our work at CGFI sits into that, and uh, the really exciting agenda that we have for today. So, and I'll do this through, I guess, the lens of my own personal journey. Um, and I know that in many ways that it's become quite a, a complex landscape. There's a, there's a lot of different things going on uh, and a world of acronyms, but I thought I'd just focus on um, what I think are some of the key ways that our thinking has developed over the last 10 years or so. Um, firstly, starting with uh, Mark Carney's seminal speech uh, that really identified climate change as a financial issue, so physical transition and liability risks and therefore the need for financial disclosure. Uh, and that gave birth to uh, the, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, and many things have been built on that since. Moving forward, though, two or three years after that, I think um, there's a realization that the risks from climate change have distinctive characteristics. 
So effectively, the risks are systemic in nature, uh, and they're already beginning to crystallize through these physical transition and liability risks. But at the same time, they're also foreseeable. So these risks are going to increase as time goes by. The physical risks will continue to increase as temperatures rise. And if we are to uh, transition and stabilize global temperatures, we need to have one of the biggest structural transformations that we've ever known. So to some extent, the, the risks are foreseeable and they're significant and they're going to grow over time. And therefore, there's a need to take an enhanced approach to how the financial sector deals with climate as a financial risk, but as a risk that is also distinct. And that led to uh, a range of new interventions across the central banking and regulatory systems, such as climate stress tests that uh, effectively extended time horizons out to 2050, uh, as well as setting supervisory expectations for firms not only to deal with the risks of today, but also to think about the role they can play to help steward the net zero economy. So effectively looking at actions that firms can take today to help manage the future. And then we also saw um, the emergence of things like the Climate Financial Risk Forum uh, and the Network for Greening the Financial System in recognition that we need to take collaborative action uh, to deal with the challenges of climate. Fast forwarding a few more years, we've had expectations of firms to play a more active role in the transition, turning into commitments to do so. So the arrival of net zero finance, uh, and as we know, many financial institutions now have set uh, net zero commitments and net zero targets. I think over 650 firms and $150 trillion of assets committed to net zero, which is all very welcome. At the same time, we've also seen some of the unintended consequences that can come from a very narrow focus around setting and meeting targets at the level of the portfolio. Because as we look back and think through what's needed to help price financial risks and opportunities um, at the portfolio level, we understand that carbon can actually be quite a poor proxy for financial risk. So many high carbon firms, for example, if you're mining lithium or you're mining copper, could be well positioned and critical for the transition. And many low carbon, uh, many firms that report low carbon emissions can be firms in the service sector. Uh, and we also have seen that if we're, if we're looking at the second phase and how that's a, um, and dealing with a systemic issue, if we are to try to address the systemic risks, there's challenges that can come from just greening your own balance sheets rather than necessarily greening the economy. And that's why, uh, for me, it's been such a pleasure to work with many others uh, in helping to lead the disclosure framework of the Transition Plan Task Force, which is calling for a, a strategic and rounded approach to the transition that understands the distinctions between managing financial risks and opportunities, decarbonizing a portfolio, and then contributing towards the economy-wide transition. And I think this is all really exciting because I feel at the, uh, over a course of a decade now through learning these lessons, we've landed at a very coherent way of thinking through not just climate, but nature related risks too. And we'll be hearing more about that throughout the day. And that's important to us at CGFI because as we move towards a coherent framework, we can make sure that the data and analytics that we use are specific to the right use case. So what the data analytics we need to manage for climate-related risks is slightly distinct from those that we need to manage climate impacts, which are going to be distinct from those that we need to assess whether firms are making a contribution to the broader transition. So um, I wanted to share that because I think it's a good basis by which we can then build throughout the day uh, on the conversations that we are going to have. And at CGFI, Oh, sorry, one final point there is that we've also then seen the, again, the integration of nature and adaptation, just transition into things like the, the TPT framework. And in terms of where CGFI sits into that, so our origins lie back in 2019 with the first UK green finance strategy. I had the pleasure to lead with a number of other people who are in the room. Uh, and the green finance strategy really set out the fact that when we think about green finance, there's both the financing of more green assets 
as well as the integration of climate and environmental factors across the whole of finance, which we termed greening finance. And whilst we set up the Green Finance Institute to help to support the financing of green, CGFI has emerged to then take forward the greening of finance, which is the integration of climate uh, environmental factors across the whole of the financial system. Uh, our consortium is a multi-university consortium, as you can see there, backed by or working with a whole range of different partners, many of whom are in the room with us today. Um, and um, our vision is one of accelerating the adoption and the use of climate, nature, and environmental data and analytics into finance. And we do that in line with uh, the opening scene setting I did along, along these three aspects. So firstly, we work to get the right framework, standards, and policies in place to ensure that we have an economy-wide transition. We have uh, work happening across the consortium around data analytics and translational research. And then we also support innovation uh, across the whole ecosystem to bring forward new approaches to data and analytics. Uh, just to give you a really quick flavor of all of those, so uh, as already mentioned, some of the flagship work we've been doing uh, at CG5 in partnership with E3G, and delighted to have Kate here, uh, is around the Transition Plan Task Force, and we'll hear more about that uh, throughout the course of the day, um, and including the strategic and rounded approach that I've referenced earlier. Our work around data and analytics um, is a mixture of providing open source data sets and tools, of which there's a whole range of different examples there, particularly focused around climate science and physical risk, uh, but more broadly, we also provide um, and publish a whole number of different research papers and articles, and you'll learn much more about some of this during the course of the day at our research showcase. And then we also appreciating the fact as an academic consortium, there's only so much we can do to bring real world innovation into the private sector. So we work with a whole range of commercial organizations to foster innovation. That includes working with, through our Leeds Innovation Hub and our London Innovation Hub. And great to have colleagues from both of those joining this afternoon. We support Green FinTech Innovation, a forthcoming report that we'll be launching shortly around green fintech in the UK, and then also uh, a data analytics prize forthcoming at the middle of June. And that's built on uh, a range of activities we also do to help to convene, to build capacity, and to foster collaboration. So in the top left, you'll see a picture from last year's CGFI forum. In the bottom center, one of our events in the Leeds Innovation Hub. And on the top right-hand side, uh, some of the capacity building work we've been doing, for example, with the Bank of Thailand, with many of the partners involved. So that's CGFI. Uh, and then in terms of the annual forum, um, what are we hoping to get out of today? So after uh, my own opening remarks, I've mentioned I'm delighted to have Vanessa Harvard-Williams here to talk about the Transition Finance Market Review. We are then going to move into a panel um, on policy frameworks and standards for an economy-wide transition. Um, delighted that will be chaired by Kate Levick. We'll then go into a coffee break uh, and then move into the second pillar of what it is that we do around integrating climate, uh, around climate financial decision-making in the context of data and analytics. So uh, delighted that Joe will be chairing that for us today. Um, and then after lunch, we're going to have an afternoon keynote um, from uh, colleague Ian Williams at NERC and a fireside chat that's going to get into infrastructure investing and nature. Uh, and then in the after, uh, we'll move into parallel sessions. So you'll have the choice of whether to join us at a panel here in the Telford Theatre looking at tipping points and managing uncertainty or to join a showcase on innovation. Um, and then following a coffee break, uh, again, we'll have parallel sessions in the afternoon around assessing, assessing nature-related risk, and then a research showcase uh, looking at all the brilliant research that is happening across the ecosystem. Uh, and then finally, we're going to invite you to join us in the Great Hall with a final keynote speaker, Chris Skidmore, 
uh, and a few closing remarks, including hopefully from our sponsors at Howden's. Um, so hopefully that helps to set the scene a little bit in terms of a bit of a perspective of, of how far we have come over the last decade or so on greening finance and investments uh, and some of the policies and frameworks that have evolved to do that. The work that we do at CGFI across our three pillars uh, and then also the shape of today. Um, really excited. I think we've got a, a brilliant day ahead of us uh, and great to see uh, many of you join. And on that note, uh, we'd love to invite up Vanessa to tell us a little bit more about the Transition Finance Market Review. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, and thank you very much, Matt and CGFI, for the invitation. Um, really good to get the transition finance market review in, in people's minds, particularly at, at the moment as we are digesting responses to the call and we're, we're uh, in the midst of engagement. Um, the transition to a net zero world is really now well underway. I think we can see that. And we can also see that the nature of the climate is changing rapidly, probably more rapidly than we all thought. Um, and that offers enormous opportunity for countries as they optimize their relative positions on green and sustainable trade and finance. And it also offers a range of quite serious risks to those who move too slowly. To meet our nature and climate objectives, and the TFMR has both in its terms of reference, um, we must quickly scale up finance for the infrastructure and the technologies needed to transition the global economy and to put it on a resilient footing. Net zero needs very significant investment and the evidence suggests that the benefits substantially outweigh the cost. And that means that capital has to be directed thoughtfully to maximize its impact. If finance is only channeled towards established green sectors like renewables, there's a risk that other sectors such as heavy industry and more diffuse high emitting sectors like agriculture, or real estate will be starved of the investment that they urgently need to build a credible path to net zero. Transition finance, referring to financial products and services that support an organization to credibly decarbonize its activities, so not particular subsets generally. Transition finance is more complicated than focusing on green plays and it can be controversial. But while the topic can stimulate negative reactions and greenwashing allegations, a credible transition finance market supported by appropriate guardrails, standards and frameworks has an essential role in creating a low carbon resilient future. And what's more, with the bulk of transition finance set to be raised on private markets, it presents a significant economic opportunity. So this is something we have to think about. To build and scale a successful market for transition finance, we need to provide guardrails to drive the integrity and credibility of transition finance decisions. We may need to think, as Matt said, more about financing emission reductions and not just about reducing financed emissions. All of this will require investors, issuers and other stakeholders to be aligned, to be able to act with confidence, supported by necessary market principles and frameworks, which I think Kate will go on to talk about in, in her panel, and relevant regulation. With climate impacts becoming more visible by the day, we're all working against the clock. A dynamic and pragmatic approach is essential to create momentum and to encourage meaningful progress. 
Standards for transition finance must balance ambition with being fit for purpose and scalable, enabling uptake of transition finance among market actors while avoiding unintended consequences such as capital flight, an unjust transition, or threatening environmental integrity. As the leading net exporter of financial services across the world, the largest center for cross-border banking and borrowing and the largest market for both FX trading and insurance, the UK can play a significant role in financing the global transition and shaping a credible market globally. The Transition Finance Market Review that I chair was launched earlier this year and it's been tasked with independently gathering and analysing evidence to assess how the UK can establish itself as a global hub for transition finance. I'm supported by an expert group drawn from across the market and a secretariat, and two of them are here today, Agat and Joe. And although I'll be um, heading off at 11 to go to the Mansion House, they, I think they'll be around, so please talk to them. Our call for evidence, which we published in March, uh, ran for eight weeks and it received nearly 60 responses um, from financial and professional services sector, um, the civil, soci civil society and corporates and, and lots of trade associations. And can I just say thank you very much. Um, those responses were uh, detailed and thoughtful. People have really considered how to um, get this market moving and it's very much appreciated. We'll draw from these responses uh, we're currently midway through some pretty extensive stakeholder engagement and we're also doing further analysis and all of that will inform practical recommendations primarily to industry to unlock transition finance. An obvious area for consideration is the development of guiding principles that financial institutions can use for categorizing activities or businesses for transition finance purposes. These could specify that to qualify as transition or as sustainable improver in respect of transition, borrowers or their assets and activities must align either to taxonomies or to a transition plan or strategy that satisfies core requirements. One route for an entity to be eligible for a transition badge, label or tag um, would be to develop and publish a Paris Align transition plan developed in accordance with the TPT disclosure framework um, that, that, that Mark was so instrument, uh, sorry, Matt was so, uh, so instrumental in de developing, and Mark as well, and Kate, you know, a lot of people. Um, we recognize um, that among other guardrails, Robust transition plans could become one of the main tools for ensuring the credibility and integrity of transition finance. However, we also recognize that many companies and institutions don't yet have uh, developed published transition plans. So alternative routes to allow for Paris aligned transition strategies will also be needed at least in the short term. And we also need to consider what is proportionate, for example, in relation to SMEs. Any guiding, guiding principles would also be of relevance to the scaling up of transition finance markets internationally. The UK's financial services industry supports and channels a significant volume of international capital every day. It represents the largest sustainable and green bond market in the world. It accounts for 38% of FX trading and it hosts hundreds of foreign banks, law firms, yay to law firms, and other financial professional services providers. Given their relevance to cross-border flows of capital, any principles will need to work with local market conditions in mind and with appropriate regional or national pathways. To scale transition finance markets in emerging markets and developing economies, more work is needed to disaggregate these, sec these pathways by sector and ensure that they are aligned with the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement and also to build capacity among market, uh, among market actors. Cross-sectoral collaboration and innovation is going to be key from shaping and scaling financial and insurance products or combinations of them to incentivize credible decarbonisation 
to honing risk analysis and management processes and developing a robust data rating and disclosure ecosystem. Well, I feel in this country we're, we're, we're making real progress. We've received plenty of feedback on how best to support this, and it's going to be something that we focus on throughout the review. The UK's financial services industry has always been a global centre of innovation. With our strength in financial and insurance markets, professional services, and cutting edge data and clean tech, our sustainable finance professionals, and our strength in terms of our universities, we have a super strong foundation from which to shape bankable strategies and create a dynamic and effective transition finance ecosystem. We hope the review will be an important further signal in the journey that we're all taking, building on work people have done and are doing in other markets, Singapore, for example, Hong Kong, India, who have a similar task force. And that the review, with all the inputs we have had, will help guide the way for corporates, financial institutions, uh, professional firms and civil society here, all to work together on implementing steps that should help to finance a greener, more resilient and more sustainable future. So if you have views, and I'm sure in this room you all have views, that you haven't already shared, or if you get asked to attend a round table, or you hear about one and want to participate, please let us know, because we'd love to hear from you. And I just want to end by saying thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Really interested in the next panel. And I'm going to hand back to Matt to take over <coughs> from here. Great, many thanks, Vanessa.